the Director of External Engagement here at the University of Illinois Research Park. We are home to the Illinois FAST Center, which focuses on um, assisting and helping uh, entrepreneurs, researchers, and startups from across the state of Illinois help to access information resources and hopefully put together um, a very competitive proposal for uh, the SBI, our funding that's available through, um, through the 11 different federal agencies that offer these resources to small businesses. We are very lucky to have amassed uh, a brain trust of expertise in um, this somewhat niche uh, arena of the SBIR world. Um, and today you're gonna meet actually two of our, uh, two of the people who make up, and I see Roland is here as well. So we'll, we'll feel free to give him a shout out too, but we're gonna meet two people who are engaged in our FAST Center and here are here to provide their expertise. Um, the first one is actually someone who's just joined our team. We're really excited to um, have our new Illinois FAST Center manager. So welcome to Shelly Maves. Um, she, I see her on video. So uh, she is um, a proud University of Illinois alum. That's not why we hired her, but it doesn't hurt, right? So uh, she has a PhD in biochemistry. She's worked at Baxter, you know, a little company some of you might have heard of in the biotech arena. She spun out her own biotech company, became the director of resource, and applied for SBIR funding in that capacity, which somewhat led her to the role that she has now, which is um, helping other companies um, as well as organizations access SBIR funding as well as other types of government grants. She's worked with many colleagues um, in the Chicago region uh, and across Illinois, and we are very excited to have her here as our new Illinois FAST Center manager. So welcome, Shelly. Um, so we will, uh, we will then, of course, introduce today's uh, speaker. We will also provide some opportunities for in the chat so that you all understand how to access our experts for the for some one-on-one -on -one, um, consulting, and you can. Uh, you know, work with them, uh, of course, in a more uh, um, exclusive way. So we will do that um, in the chat as well. But I'm really pleased to introduce today's speaker, uh, Chris Parmalee. We won't hold it against her, actually. Maybe we will, but um, that she is a graduate of Indiana. She comes to us today um, from the Indianapolis area. She uh, also has a, a lots of uh, years of experience actually in uh, from fundraising to launching her own venture that was accessing federal grants as well as foundation money. And then she expanded her experience um, to include the world of SBIR and has um, almost exclusively focused on SBIR, STTR resources for clients over the last 15 years. So we are really excited to have Chris today to talk about project pitch. So um, we do have, well, Chris is expert, also has expertise in working with other agencies. We know that in the Illinois community that NSF is often uh, one of the agencies that folks turn to first, frankly, mainly because they, have, they offer the most uh, widest uh, array of opportunities for entrepreneurs and companies. And so today, Chris is going to talk about how to access at the NSF SBIR program through its unique project pitch. So thank you so much for being here today, Chris, and take it away. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Laura. Uh, I'm super excited to talk about this topic today. Let me just share my slides here. Doesn't matter how much I use Zoom, I still am feel like a neophyte every time. Okay. All right. Today we're talking about uh, preparing your project pitch for NSF. Um, I believe that the an email went out about how to submit questions. Um, and I think you are, are doing that online or via email. Um, if that's not right, somebody let me know. But um, Feel free to submit any questions at any time. And, and if, if we get some in, uh, whoever's monitoring that, feel free to stop me in the middle. I'm, I'm a pretty casual presenter, so it's not like it's gonna throw me off. Um, 
All right, so we're going to talk about uh, preparing your project pitch. So just briefly to go over what we're gonna talk about today, first, we're gonna look at the NSF SVIR STTR program at a real high level. Um, then we'll talk about identifying your topic and then preparing your pitch. And I'm gonna share with you uh, some examples of actual submitted pitches today to sort of talk about structure and, and order of information. Um, and then just you know, kind of what to expect next after you submit your pitch. So uh, to get started, just a quick look at NSF's SBIR program. Like all SBIR STTR programs, um, if you submit to NSF, you must be a small business, a for-profit organization with 500 or fewer employees and located primarily and operating in the United States. Um, at least 50% of the company must be owned by US citizens or permanent residents. And um, NSF does not permit participation by companies that are majority VC owned, um, are majority owned by private equity firms or hedge funds. Now, um, those, those organizations, if your company is majority owned by any of those, um, you know, the first place that you would want to stop to get some clarification is NSF to make sure or to determine your eligibility. That is not the world that I work in. Most of the companies that I work in work with are um, small businesses uh, with two to 10 employees and um, the majority are spin outs from the university environment. So this is not really my world. I can't answer a lot of questions about how those, those types of companies would navigate the process, but there are resources to help you do that. And I'm happy to direct those you to those if, if that's your case. Uh, for NSF, the principal investigator must be employed by the company at least 20 hours per week. Uh, this is slightly different than the way other agencies say it. Um, other agencies typically say that you must be more than 50% employed by the company at time of award, but they say 20 hours per week at the company. And you must commit one calendar month to the project over six months. So that's also different than other agencies talk about uh, time commitment to a project. Uh, most agencies say that you must commit a minimum of 10% to the project, which if you were talking about a 12 month long project would be 1.2 calendar months over the 12 month project. So NSF does expect principal investigators to commit a little bit more time um, than the traditional SBIR STTR. Okay, they uh, issue um, one solicitation per year. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah, one solicitation per year, but they have three separate deadlines. Um, I'm sorry, four separate deadlines. We've already passed two of them. So you can see at the bottom, I've scratched out the two that they have. So the current open program is June 4th through September 2nd. And what that means is that you can submit your proposal anytime during June 4, anytime from June 4th to September 2nd. There is one currently open, it closes June 3rd. If you haven't started by now, you're not gonna make it. So I put a line through that one. Um, if you're already in the process, that would be the next time you submit. So what happens, What they went to this rolling deadline. Uh, the idea was that it would give uh, proposers more flexibility for submission. Um, previously, they had set deadlines like other agencies did. Um, and the other idea was that it would sort of spread the workload out over the course of the year for program officers. One of their intentions was to sort of shorten the timeline in between submission and award. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. That has not happened yet, but um, the other idea was, you know, to sort of spread the timeline out. So what happens now with these rolling deadlines is if you submit, let's say, let's say you're working on a proposal now and the deadline is June 3rd, the next submission target, if you miss it, opens June 4th. So there's never a time when you can't submit a proposal, but the difference is the way I imagine it is for some reason, I always get a claw machine in my head and um, you know all the proposals go into the bucket and then on June 3rd, the claw comes, picks up all the proposals that are in the bucket and starts sending them to the reviewers. Now, they've been pretty transparent about the fact that if you're shooting for that June 3rd deadline and it's June 4th and you haven't submitted yet, you should still submit as soon as you are ready because they might not pick up the bucket 
on June 3rd. They might not pick it up till June 5th or June 6th, and you could potentially still get in that bucket pickup. Otherwise, your proposal wouldn't really get picked up until September 2nd. So they have this one solicitation a year. Um, they, they issue these very broad topics that do not change substantially from year to year. And we'll look at those topics in a minute. Um, and, um, and they do have separate, uh, they issue a separate set of instructions for the SBIR and STTR, but they are only slightly different, but they do have different numbers, different, different RFA numbers. Uh, so phase one for NSF is a firm cap at $256,000, and that's what I say all in. So that means your, um, your, your fee, your overhead, your contractors, all in, $256,000 is a hard cap. It's typically a six to 12 month project period for phase one. Phase two, which we're not really talking about today, but is uh, capped at a million dollars, and it's typically a two year project period. So what happens when that big claw machine comes and picks up all those proposals? Well, the first one to three months, they undergo uh, merit reviews. And typically what happens is first the program officers sort of do a compulsory review and, and make sure everything is attached and figure out what study section to send it to or what, what review committee to send it to and how those review committees are going to be organized. Um, and that can take one to three months. Um, then in four to six months, you're notified whether your proposal has been accepted or declined. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons they went to these rolling deadlines was they, they had the hopes of sort of shortening that timeline. Um, in my experience, since they made this move about a year and a half ago is the timeline has not been shortened at all. Um, in fact, they were inundated with proposals related to COVID for a special call they had for COVID. And that timeline actually was even further out uh, this last go around. It was closer to about seven months. Um, so it is a very long timeline. Uh, further, something that's different, if you apply to National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Health has sort of um, some opportunities for you to watch your proposal move through the system. NSF has pretty much two types of uh, two different updates on your proposal and they are either pending or declined or funded. So there's no, you know, you're currently in review, we're waiting for your results or, I mean, you, you know nothing for six months or seven months or four months or however long it takes. It's, it just says pending and then the next time it'll change to either approved or declined. Uh, if you are going to be funded though, um, you typically start to hear questions from NSF at about that four to six month. Um, they may ask for some revised information or some additional information. They may ask for some clarification as they sort of go and um, prepare to make that decision. Um, I don't really have a slide in here about the review process with NSF, but um, essentially they assemble a, peer, a, a panel of peer reviewers who rank and score applications. Um, and then the, uh, the available budget is used to sort of set a pay line based on those scores uh, and the rankings. And if your proposal is above that pay line, you get funded. If it's below, you do not. Um, and they, they score proposals based on very competitive, competitive, um, excellent, or not competitive. So uh, it's a little bit different than the other agencies and how they score, but the process is, is similar. It's just done without much communication. And then finally, they're saying five to six months, you receive funding. Again, my experience is closer to six to seven months, especially right now. Um, and then you can begin that, that, that project. Um, NSF does have a really extensive website with lots and lots of resources. Uh, they sort of, um, liken themselves as the grandfather of the SBIR program. Um, they uh, previously, um, back when we had conferences in person and even further back, you know, maybe 10 years ago or so, they actually planned and, and hosted all of the SBIR conferences, including a, a, what was a fantastic annual conference. Um, and they, they've since stopped doing that and had other agencies fill that role. But um, they are a leader in uh, SBIR resources and um, uh, 
uh, access to information. So they have great tutorials on their website. They have um, extensive profiles of all the startups that have been funded. Um, they have they host virtual office hours. Um, they have webinars on a regular basis. So there's lots of resources for you. In addition to going to NSF's website, which is right up there at the top, seedfund.nsf.gov. And people are sometimes confused. They'll say, I want to apply for the seed fund. The seed fund is SBIR, STTR, NSF just calls it seed fund. Um, in addition to their website, I also highly recommend the sbir.gov website, which is at the bottom of this slide. Um, you can go into sbir.gov. There's a section, a tab called reports. And you can filter those reports based on agency, phase one, phase two, state, year, all different kinds of, of um, filters available. And you could review uh, abstracts of funded NSF projects specifically to your state, uh, which is sort of nice. And you might be able to see other people in your state that are active in the program. And by the way, one of the reasons that we review abstracts of funded proposals is to help you sort of narrow the focus of what an agency is looking for. Um, so just to see how other people talk about their projects, if it's in a similar, you know, if you're doing artificial intelligence, you might go look at some of those artificial intelligence abstracts of funded proposals to help you understand better how the agency likes to see that information or um, how they like you to, to talk about that technology. So here's how um, NSF describes the type of technology that they're looking for. This is sort of their their wish list for technology. Um, typically, they say game changing. Uh, so innovation that could really make a difference to people. Um, this is not incremental improvement here. This is significant advancements in technology. They like high risk technology. They like uh, technology that's based um, on, on un unproven um, uh, approaches more so than other agencies. So typically, when we look at NSF, for example, um, we're talking about projects that would be appropriate that don't have a lot of preliminary data. Uh, if you're going to NIH, you absolutely need preliminary data. That is less so the case at NSF than NIH. Now, preliminary data always helps you. It's always helpful, but it's not as much of a hard requirement with NSF as it is NIH because they are a little bit more interested in risk. NIH tends to be slightly more risk adverse uh, they want to, to see more evidence and proof that a project is likely to succeed. But NSF is a little bit more out there. They're, they're willing to take a little bit more uh, risk than some of the other agencies. There must be market pull, evidence that your product or service could meet an important unmet need. This is obviously really important because NSF has a heavy emphasis on commercialization. Uh, if you go to write a full NSF proposal, you'll see that the very first section is actually commercialization. Uh, and, and it's extensive, even in a phase one, which a lot, almost every other agency, we don't talk about commercialization in that depth until phase two. But for NIH or NSF, we do. So uh, they're, they really want technology that has a market pull. And finally, they want technology that's scalable. Scalability is critically important to them. Now, I'll tell you one other thing that is not on their list of things they look for in technology, um, but is brought up by reviewers every single time right now. And that is uh, technology that um, has the potential to uh, have value placed in its intellectual property. Uh, so if something you're developing can't be patented, let's say because it's developed in open source uh, software coding or whatever, you know, one of the more difficult things to, to really secure some solid IP around, that's okay, uh, but you need to have a solid plan. And they are way more interested in what your intellectual property plan is in phase one than other agencies are. So intellectual property plays, uh, plays an important role in NSF as well. All right, topic identification. We're gonna look at their topics in just a second, um, but uh, they do ask you when you're submitting your pitch, um, and I guess I should have backed up all the way to the beginning and, and talked a little bit more about the pitch process. So if you wanna submit a full proposal to NSF, the very first step is this pitch. 
And the reason I like the pitch is because it's a very low barrier to entry, uh, which we'll see in just a little bit. You're talking about 2000 words total. Uh, it's an online form. Uh, you get a quick response. Um, and so um, it, it's just one more way of letting you know that your, your project is appropriate for the program before you write an entire proposal. Uh, the, the pitch is non-binding. So um, when you submit it, uh, you're, you're simply telling NSF what you would like to do, uh, but it, it's not in itself um, a commitment that you're absolutely going to do that project um, and submit a proposal. So what, what I recommend is if you're thinking about submitting an NSF at all, go ahead and do the pitch. Preparing the pitch itself, as we'll see and walk through the steps, is a great exercise submit the pitch, and then if you're invited to submit a full proposal, then think about whether you really want to do it or not. That's the time to really make that decision. Um, but the pitch is the first step, and it, it's necessary in order to get to that, that full proposal. And so sometimes people, you know, when we have uh, initial conversations, spend a lot of time, I'm not sure if we're ready to do the full proposal. I'm not sure if I have time right now to work on the proposal. Those points are all moot if you're not invited to submit. So the very first step is seeing if you can submit. If that becomes a reality that you get invited to submit, then make the decision whether you want to submit a full proposal or not. You have a full year after you're invited to submit that proposal. When you submit your pitch, you are, requ you, you, you are required to uh, select a topic. Now, topic identification at the time of your pitch is simply a guess. And if you make the wrong choice, it won't preclude you from being invited to submit a full proposal. So somebody will just reassign it to a different topic. Uh, but the topics, as we'll see, are pretty general. Uh, so most of the time, you're, you're probably going to make the right choice. There is a project manager um, or a, a program officer for each topic area. Uh, and they appear on the website with their email address. I'll show you an example of that next. And their topic areas are organized by technology. Um, they do have a technology for a top technology area for medical device, but there is no direct drug development supported by NSF and no clinical trials. Um, now, there's a distinction between projects that involve human subjects and projects that are clinical trials. Uh, and so, if your project involves human subjects, that's fine. Uh, they will support that. Um, I'd say, you know, 75% of NSF projects do not involve human subjects, but there's certainly times when it's appropriate to have human subjects. That does not automatically mean you're doing a clinical trial, uh, but they do not support clinical trials. Um, if you have a technology that you're developing that will eventually need a clinical trial, NSF may still be an appropriate initial step for you uh, and then look at going to, for example, NIH to fund that clinical trial portion, but look to NSF to fund sort of the phase one technology itself. Each one of the topic areas has a topic that's um, uh, called other. Uh, so, you know, even if you're a medical device and you don't see the subtopic that fits your technology, you can just throw it in other. Um, and then there's a whole topic called other. So here's a look at all of the topics. And you can see how broad they are, advanced materials. Um, and we'll look at some, what, what some of those subtopics look like in the next slide. Um, but they're all very general. And again, there is that other technologies topic area. Oh, I lost my little arrow. Oh, there, OK. All right, so here's an example of the biomedical technologies topic. You can see down uh, on the right hand side, there's the program manager um, and there's his email address. Everybody has their picture on the website with their email and the topics that they're responsible for. So this is the biomedical technologies topic. Um, it's very, very broad. And then you can see underneath there are the subtopics, which are equally as broad. And so what typically I say for NIH is if you're working on something related to public health, NIH wants to see it. Well, for NSF, if you're working on something that involves, uh, that's tech focused or tech heavy, uh, they probably wanna see it. You can probably find a way to fit it into one of their topics. 
Um, and, and I should say that tech, uh, which if you're familiar with SBIR, STTR at, at all, you know, when we say innovative technology, um, we don't just mean, you know, a, a technology like, you know, hardware and software systems. Um, so technology has a really broad definition within this program. I don't know what, oh, there we go. Okay, so there are four sections to the pitch. Um, the pitches are all submitted on an online portal that NSF has. You go to the portal, you enter your, your email address, create a little account, and then it takes you to, to submit the, the um, pitch. You can only submit one pitch at a time. You can only have one pitch under consideration at a time, um, which means if you submit a pitch and you're waiting to hear back and your team comes up with another idea, you have to wait until you hear on that pitch uh, before you can uh, create another pitch. I recommend creating a Word document. I use a template. Um, I have a template set up for the pitch uh, that has these four sections, that has the word count. Um, and so I recommend creating a Word document to allow you to develop and hone the pitch prior to going online and submitting it. It'll, it'll let your whole team contribute. And I recommend using almost every word available. If I see a section for technology innovation and you're allowed 500 words and it's only 350 words, that is a missed opportunity. Um, you're leaving something on the table there. So I recommend you, you're, you should be as close to the word count as possible. Okay, so the first part is technology innovation. This is a 500 word section and uh, I think this is probably the most important section uh, because this is your first chance to grab the reviewer. And, and by the way, the reviewer at this point is the program manager. Um, the program manager is reviewing your pitch to determine whether they think it's a fit with NSF or not. And uh, I think I cover this later in the slides, but I would say that 90% of the pitches submitted are going to get invited to submit a full proposal. So I don't want you to, to misconstrue an invitation to submit a pitch as any indication whether or not you're gonna get funded. Um, the majority of people who submit pitches are going to be invited. Now, um, similarly, don't misconstrue how quickly you hear back as an indication of how likely are, you are to get funded. Uh, I think sometimes it just depends on when your pitch hits the program officer's mailbox, uh, how quickly they might respond. Um, so sometimes people call and say, oh my gosh, we heard back from them in, in a week. They really they must really want this technology. I don't think that's any indication of how interested they are in your technology. I think it is more a reflection on their workload and when they chose to go through their pitches. Um, but even though 90% are invited to submit, uh, for those who are not invited to submit, I'm always thrilled uh, that we find out you're not invited instead of finding out after we prepare an entire proposal only to have it, have it um, come back as you know, not really appropriate. If you submit a pitch and you're not invited, you can refine it and submit it again. So um, certainly have done that with some folks where we've had to go in two or three times before we really honed the, the approach that NSF is looking for. Okay, so part one is the technology innovation. And again, this is, the, your, this is a really important section. This is a big punch to the program officer to grab them right off of the bat um, and get them interested in your project. Here are the instructions. Um, describe the technical innovation that would be the focus, a brief discussion of the origins, um, how you meet the mandate to focus on R&D of unproven high impact innovations. Remember we looked at that slide that showed those four key things that they're looking for. Okay, so I'm gonna break this down for you to the different kind of sections, how I divide this into sections. Um, and the first sent the first paragraph, I always define the pro problem right off the bat, like a hard statistic, a hard, like let reviewers know right away why anybody should care. Excuse me, the, the example that we're gonna look at for, um, I, took, I took separate examples and used them for each separate section of the, the uh, proposal. So for, for part one, we're gonna be looking at examples from uh, a pitch to support a technology that would help 
improve online learning for students, which obviously given COVID-19, all the students who were uh, at home learning, um, we all know what a challenge that was. So uh, right off the bat, he's leading with, you know, 55 million students were out of school uh, learning online. Um, so that's a pretty staggering statistic. So right away, the reviewer's like, wow, you know, that's a, that's a ton of kids. So we're uh, providing context for the reviewer in this very first section. We're setting the stage. We're letting them know why they should care. Um, we're letting them know what problem the technology is, is solving. And then um, the next thing we look at is what's the current state of the art? Um, what's happening now? And then we lead into your solution. So we say, here's why you should care. Here's how the problem's being solved now. And here's how we're going to make it better. Um, and so that about the second or third paragraph is typically where we're going to introduce your proposed solution. Um, so you can see we lead off with a sentence in this paragraph. We use the company name right away and we say exactly what they're developing. Um, so Crossroads Technology has developed a highly successful model called the Learning Commons. That's what this proposal is about. Um, so we in this paragraph, tell the reviewer who you are, what you've created, and why it's better, faster, cheaper than what's available right now. Um, and then let them know the current state of your technology. And then we set the stage for uh, kind of like easing them into, we're getting ready to discuss the technical objectives. That's the next section. So we're sort of easing them into that discussion uh, we're letting them know, um, you know, what the, the end goal of the project is, which would be that commercialization. Um, so this section to me, the section one, part one, the technology innovation to me is almost like a little executive summary. Um, but it, it's got to have a pretty significant punch to, to get the reviewer engaged. Okay, so that section was 500 words. And the second section that's 500 words is the technical objectives and challenge. This section is also critically important. Um, and, and honestly, those are the two big sections. Those are the, both the 500 word sections. And the way I look at it is that those, both of those sections need to start off really strong because odds are the reviewer is going to start with one of those two sections. And which one they start with probably depends on their own, the way their mind works, which obviously we can't predict. Um, very similar to how um, a phase two proposal always has the, the proposal and a commercialization plan. And I know for sure that some reviewers start with a commercialization plan because that's where their head is, they're commercial people. Some start with the technical proposal because they're technical people. Same thing here. Some reviewers are going to start with looking at what is your technical objective, what is the technical challenge you have to overcome, and then some will look more at sort of that part one, which is the overview to sort of set the stage. So for those technical people, we need to hit it right off the bat very clearly, here are our technical objectives. I'm not going to read all this to you, uh, this text below, but these are the actual guidelines from, from the pitch what they want to see in this section. So, whoops. So this uh, example that we're using here, this is for a company called Project Process, um, which uh, this is an interesting project. She's developing a um, portable sink to for people to wash their hands, which sounds, every time I think about it, I'm like that, there's no way that's a need, but she has all kinds of data that demonstrates that there is a huge need for this to reduce um, transmission of C. diff and, and other um, uh, viruses in, especially in home health care and hospital settings. So um, the first section, you can see she starts right off. Project process has developed a minimally invasive product. Uh, we've already told them in the first section what PBS is. Um, it's a portable basin sink for early pilot testing and to conduct customer discovery interviews. Then she's going to share what she's done to date, 
um, you know, blah, blah, blah. So what have you already accomplished so far? Where, where are you jumping off from? And then ending with what is the current technical challenge? What is that one thing that you still have to overcome in order to enter the market? or get closer to entering the market. We all know that phase one and phase two don't really get you all the way to the market, but get you closer. Um, you know, phase one and phase two, it's all about sort of uh, creating that forward momentum toward the market. So we're just trying to show reviewers that this project does in fact sort of have that, that trajectory toward commercialization. And then the next thing is just clearly stating the phase one overall goal. And you can see right here, we say that in order to further the development of the technology and move the prototype closer to commercialization, project process must revise the prototype and complete usability testing among, among potential end users. That's the overall goal of phase one. And then we say project process proposes the following technical objectives. And here they are. And we enumerate those, techno those technical objectives. They should be parsed out from the text um, and, and with numbers so that a reviewer can quickly see how many technical objectives are you proposing and specifically what are they? Excuse me. And so um, that's what we've done here. She has two technical objectives. The first is to revise the prototype design based on the preliminary pilot testing. And the second is to develop on-unit patient education methods and data capture methods. Very clear technical objectives. Then we discuss underneath that, we discuss a little bit about how she will accomplish those and sort of what the subtasks are, um, but very clearly demonstrating the, the technical objectives. And then I think this part is really important. This is the last section of part two. Um, and you need to summarize the feasibility. So what will you have or know at the end of phase one? What, is, what will that look like? If you have a successful phase one, what will it look like? And then what will phase two look like? And that doesn't have to be extensive. It's a one-liner. Phase two will focus on tracking patient usage using RFID and integration into patient electronic health records. Very simple. You don't have to go into a lot of detail. But again, you're letting reviewer know, reviewers know that this is a project that you are planning to move across the continuum of commercialization. All right, part three. Now, the next two parts are limited to 250 words each, but I don't think that means they're any less important. I think it just means you have to choose your words more carefully. Uh, part, part three is the market opportunity. And if you remember, I talked about uh, National Science Foundation more than a lot of other agencies uh, has a, a pretty significant emphasis on commercialization. So this is an important section. Here are the requirements as listed in the, the pitch instructions. Okay, um, we are looking at, uh, oh, here we're looking at, this is a project that involves um, uh, sensors, little tiny like wafers. This is kind of technology that's beyond my understanding, but um, for harnessing energy, um, for uh, technology that requires access to energy for, for like um, internet of technology or um, internet of things technology to always you know, connect and um, that has longer ba battery life. They're these little wafers. So um, this is actually an Illinois company uh, that's developing this. So the first thing that we do in this section, again, equally important, just fewer words, um, is define the market and the customer. Uh, many of you may be familiar that National Science Foundation uh, is the uh, creator of and leader in the i program, uh, which is all about customer discovery. And so anytime you can share anything you've done related to customer discovery to date, related to your technology, include it. And this is the place where you would do that. Uh, any conversations you've had with potential customers, any interviews you've, you've done, um, you know, and any kind of, of that uh, customer discovery work that you've already done should be included in this section. It should be summarized in this section. So here they're talking about the potential market, who the customer is. 
Um, they're saying the emergent market of IoT is projected uh, to place 1.6 billion sensors and devices on the internet by 2020. Um, and then, whoops, my apologies there. Okay. Um, and then, you know, they talk about who, who will be the best fit for this. Um, energy harvesting options currently exist, uh, blah, blah, blah. This will be in um, technologies that, you know, need to, that are dependent of external energy sources. Um, so they kind of give a, an overview of the market. And then that you need to share your strategy. So it's not enough that you just know who the market is or who the customer is, but how will you gain access into that market? Um, and, and a lot of times, um, this is one of my like hot buttons when, you know, especially with you're talking about medical device or, or drug development or anything sold in like, you know, that has a sort of a complicated um, uh, supply chain and purchasing process. And people say, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just sell it to the customer. Well, like first you have to like, you know, get the customer to talk to you. Um, and that, that can take some time. And so sort of what is your process there? Um, now I do have some of this customer discovery stuff in this section as well, where they say they've conducted 102 interviews with companies. Um, and then, um, you know, they kind of talk about the commercial markets They've, been, they've, they've confirmed that with potential customers that this is how they'll get in there. They're laying the groundwork that they have uh, access to these potential customers um, and that this is a market they're familiar with. Okay, the fourth section is the company and team. And this is also 250 words. You can see in here, this is what the guidelines say. The purpose of this section really is that we want to convey to reviewers that you have the technical knowledge to do the work you propose you're gonna do, and you have the commercial experience or business experience on your team to develop a strategy to commercialize the technology. Um, and that can be either through um, paid employees or advisors, consultants, anything like that. So we'll look at an example here uh, of a company um, uh, of their section. So this is for a company called uh, RF Health, which is a subsidiary of Recovery Force. And then we give a little bit about uh, their overall mission. Um, we let the reviewer know that the company's pre-revenue, um, they have 16 products in their pipeline. They've raised 12.3 million in R&D capital from uh, uh, strategic investors, and we say who some of those investors include. And then here's kind of a critical point. This is where we're talking about the team and letting reviewers know that they, they have the expertise. So first we talk about the CEO, who's a four-time founder in medical device industry. Uh, then we talk about the executive vice president who has manufacturing and distribution experience. And then we talk about the engineer who will actually be, and you can see, I say in, in parentheses, the PI on this phase one. So we let reviewers know which team member will be doing the technical work uh, proposed. Um, he has 20 years of medical product concept to commercialization leadership. We talk about the vice president who has licensing expertise, sales expertise, acquisitions and divestitures. Um, then that we go through, you know, then we talk about their advisors, including Mayo Clinic and some of the world's most well-known key opinion leaders in the space of vascular medicine. Uh, and we list their advisors. Okay, so don't have to give a lot of detail about what their role is on the project, but the point is you're, you're painting a picture for reviewers that you have access to the expertise you need to successfully complete the project. Okay, this is just a couple more examples. I took some more sections um, because some of that information, you know, I, I um, might put in slightly different order or um, might repeat it a different way in different sections because even though those individual sections have, have their own set of instructions, the idea is to make, you know, a lovely story to read. And sometimes it requires um, sort of changing the order of information 
um, so that we are sure we lead with the strongest and then, you know, kind of create a story for the reviewer to read. Uh, this is an example of a section from RF Health's pitch under their technology innovation section. Um, and so this is where we're talking about um, what, what they're proposing. And so we say, while the current MAC system has been developed for clinical use, what they're asking NSF to support is uh, the home use. But they say, oh, we have to overcome some key technical challenges to, to get into that market. And oh, if we get into that market, you're talking about more than 700, over a million procedures a year of patients we know could benefit from this. So they're letting the reviewer know, look, we've already you know, validated this clinically, um, but there's another market that exists, but we have some key challenges we have to overcome, technical challenges we have to overcome. Uh, this is another one from the technical objectives and challenges section. Remember I talked about, I like that very clear statement of purpose, the very clear statement of the mission um, or the goal of the project. You can see this starts right off with the purpose of this proposed SBIR is to demonstrate feasibility of the design and fabrication of a prototype integrated circuit chip for a large array of GEH unit circuits suitable for graphene placement. Super clear, gives the total picture. Then they say this phase one will produce the first article chip on a path toward a commercial product. And the very next thing that follows that is they will accomplish that with this following proposed technical objectives and listing what, what the technical objectives they would propose in phase one. Okay, this one is, oh, this is kind of an interesting project. This is for a new syringe for use uh, for procedures involving the eye. Um, that it allows more precision and doesn't require um, two hands to, to use the needle. Uh, so this is an example of their technical, their technology innovation sex, section, which again, starts out with sort of the current st uh, standard of care, the current state of the technology, and then it goes right into, in order to address the difficulties of performing uh, injections leading uh, ophthalmologist Dr. Sue invented a new one-handed release syringe. So again, you know, here's what's happening and, and here's where we can make an improvement. This is another example of uh, the company and team section, which we, if you remember, is limited to 250 words. And um, I believe this is the 250 words used. Uh, we did it in two paragraphs. The first, we talk about the company itself, um, which is led by founder Andy Washburn, and it gives all of her experience. Um, and then the second includes, uh, and she's a, you know, a one woman show. And so we wanted to show reviewers that it's beyond just Angie, that she has access to all these incredible people who are gonna help her with this project. And we list them below. Regents Reef Institute, Dr. Soares from Purdue University, uh, Michael Hull from Harvard Medical School, um, and Dr. Felty. So we sort of, you know, squeeze that all in here for, for reviewers. All right, so once you have that pitch pulled together and you meet those word count requirements, you submit your pitch. You know, typically I copy it and paste it into the online form, hit submit, and then you wait for the response. Um, again, the majority of those who are invited to submit will be invited to submit, or I'm sorry, the, the majority of those who submit a pitch will be invited to submit a full proposal. Um, it, it, it's sort of designed to weed out crazy and to help some, uh, some projects sort of further refine their technical objectives to be more consistent with, with NSF. Um, I'm hoping that I'm still connected here. Um, so again, uh, once you're invited, you have up to one year to submit that full proposal. Uh, so you don't have to decide right away. And um, I will say I had one that we just submitted that was past the one year deadline. Uh, we submitted it a few days past and I didn't, we didn't hear anything negative back. So 
I, again, those those due dates are somewhat um, arbitrary, and if that scoop hasn't come through yet, it might not be a big deal. Okay, so that is all I have uh, as far as the slides. Are do we have any specific questions? We haven't had any questions. Um, oh, here's one. Could we see an example of a full proposal pitch? Uh, absolutely. Let me uh, pull that up and share it on my screen. Tell me if you can see this because since I seem to be kind of, can you see that? We can see that, yep. Okay. Um, so this is the template that I use um, to pass things back and forth, but uh, I can't show you what it looks like online because it's literally a portal. It's like a, a, a um, form stack document or a Google doc or whatever, you know. Um, but these are the sections. This is literally what, well, this still has our comments in it. I guess this is a draft, but that's yeah. how, how we prepare it. And they are pretty, uh, they are sticklers about that word count, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a form, so you can't, you can't go over. Um, it, it won't let you. Question is, is there a project, is, is there a pitch submission for NIH the same as for NSF? And I know that Chris has a lot of expertise in, in NIH and there, this probably is a subject of a whole other seminar that we have later on, right? Yeah, there is not the same thing. Um, however, uh, remember I said NSF is sort of like the grandfather of, of the program and um, I wouldn't be surprised is if at some point some other agencies move toward this. Um, I, and I haven't seen anything like it yet, um, but you know they tend to sort of follow. And this is relatively new for NSF, so this has only been going on for about a year and a half or so. Um, so you know, like I said, we're still waiting to see some of those things they promised, like the shorter turnaround time, and I'm, maybe they're not working out like they thought, um, but. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see something like this from other agencies. Couple more questions. Uh, one is, are, does this mean that no diagrams can be included? No, they can. Um, I have an example of that. I'll show you that uh, because they can. What was difficult was when I um, tried to pull them over to uh, my slides that that was not the um, it didn't not it did not like that but here I'll show you an example of one where we did have this is the pitch for um, can you see my screen shows black on mine but can you see that yes we can see it okay so this is the one for the online learning system um, that they pitched during COVID and so this was put in there So you can do that. That was put in their uh, commercialization section or market opportunity. Sure. So this is a question which I think may in, in the pitch, this is a good question, is if we mention a PI in the pitch, is it okay to later change your PI since we haven't really committed to who that will be yet? I think it's okay. It'll probably be okay, but I would definitely email your program manager and get permission. And that doesn't have to be a big deal. Um, and and remember, you know, the 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 program officers are the people that you should be building the relationships with. One of the biggest tenants in fundraising, traditional fundraising, <clears throat> excuse me, is that people give money to people, um, and so you it really behooves you to build a relationship with those folks. And honestly, anytime you have the opportunity to email them with a legitimate question, you should because it strengthens your opportunity or it gives you more opportunity to build that relationship. And so um, I would email them and they're on, when you get the pitch invitation back, you know who your program officer is, you have their email address. And I would just drop them a quick email and say, hey, we submitted this pitch on such and such date, here's the pitch number, we were invited, we wanna make a change of the PI, here's who it was, 
here's who we want it to be. Do you have an issue with this? Is this okay? Nine times out of 10, they're gonna say sure, um, but it's that communication I think is really important. Here's another question. I work for a company that has successfully transitioned a technology through the NSF SBIR program to a commercial product. We're now considering applying for funding again through NSF. It has been five years since our first award. Have you seen companies successfully apply for NSF funding multiple times? Any tips for a returning company? Yeah, as long as it's a different technology, absolutely. Um, especially NSF loves technologies. In fact, there's a question on their full proposal um, about uh, NSF lineage. So they love any uh, technology that was, for example, if you're coming out of the university environment, any technology that was originally funded by NSF uh, grants in the university, and now you're spinning it out to a company. Um, anytime you have some sort of history with an agency, you already have uh, kind of a leg up, assuming that you, know, you, you turned in all your reports and your performance was appropriate. And as long as it's a different technology or even a technology sort of built off of that last one and you can say, you know, this originally NF NSF funded technology, blah, 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 absolutely. So we did have a question about the uh, percentage of applications that get funded. I'm not sure if that has changed at all because of the project pitch um, it's in years, I think I just did a Google search on this in 2016, they would claim that it was around 18% success rate for SBIR for NSF phase one SBIR proposals. Um, in more recent years, it seemed to have dropped, uh, to 12 to 13%. I haven't seen anything recently, but we can look for that, but that was an answer to that to a question there. And I don't know if the project pitch has impacted that at all. No, in fact, I think that's one of the reasons they implemented the pitch was because uh, that uh, award rate had dropped so low because the volume of proposals submitted was so high. So, um, you know, what I say typically across all agencies, across the entire program, you can look at an award rate of about 17 to 18%. Um, that's somewhat higher for other agencies, somewhat lower for some agencies. It goes up substantially for phase two, um, but it's pretty consistent across the program for phase one. Uh, do so to question about phase two, do teams that get phase one funding typically end up getting phase two funding? If we're talking about NSF, um, the odds are higher than other agencies. Um, so you're looking at about 50%. Um, there, there are some statistics, I have not seen this play out in real life. There are some statistics that say if you participate in i you could be looking at a funding rate of about 70 to 80% on your phase two. Um, and, and, you know, i comes in all different kinds of shapes and sizes as far as, uh, you know, local node programs versus the national program. Um, and Laura, I know you guys at, you know, the, the FAST Center has access to those programs and, and you can share more about those, but um, it does increase substantially. And that's partially because not all phase one succeeds. So there are some phase one proposals that, that um, don't succeed and they don't move on to phase two. So, you know, that competition is, and you have to have had the phase one to get the phase two. So your competition, the pool drops, which increases your likelihood of success. Uh, thank you, Chris. So we're over time. I know some, we've had a lot of folks still stick around. We definitely recommend a lot of these questions are, are better answered when we know a little bit more about your own yes. situation. Uh, and so, you know, we're doing the best we can to field these and answer them in a broad sense, but we definitely recommend that you take the opportunity. As we mentioned in the chat, uh, Illinois Fast Center services are free. Um, so please take advantage of that. We are grateful to funding that we receive from the SBA to uh, provide this program. Uh, and so I do, we, I see one last question, which I will actually answer. And it's, the question is, is it okay to mention Enterprise Works as advisors in the company and team section? 
So this is something we often have people who will ask us for letters of support. Um, and often will actually, if you are working actively with an entrepreneur in residence at Enterprise Works, will often mention those in um, as advisors in the company and team section. But really, that's on a case by case basis. Um, we would hope that you would uh, at least let us know and 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 talk to us a little bit about that before you do that. So um, thank you so much to everyone who participated today. Um, again, we encourage you to uh, reach out and access our resources um, and uh, folks like Chris and Roland and Shelly, who has joined our program. So we are, we look forward to seeing some uh, new requests from those of you. And you know what, we also recognize that everyone is at their own point in their SBIR journey. So if we can be helpful to you along that journey, let us know. Thank you so much, everyone. We will have a recording of this available in the next few weeks, um, as well as some of the resources shared today. Thanks so much.